God, all that we possess is from your loving hand. Give us grace that we may honor you with all that we own, always remembering the account we must one day give to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So our topic for today is the Seventh Commandment. So does everybody have their little catechisms anymore? Or maybe, maybe it's just in your head. Let's all say it together, okay? What is the Seventh Commandment? You shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we cannot take our neighbor's money or possessions, forget them in any dishonest way, but that all of his word permanently protect his possessions. So, the explanation that Luther gives is really going to be in two parts, and that's going to be the wholeness of what this commandment is trying to protect. Both that we don't take our neighbor's money or possessions, but it's not just that, but also that we help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. Because I don't know about you, but I might think it would be pretty easy to do this Bible study and just say, okay, don't shoplift at Walmart. Everybody covered? Good. Okay. But that's not all it's talking about. God is also giving this commandment to protect property, to protect the gifts that he gives to us for our good and for the good of our neighbor. That's what pastors have been getting at as we've been going through each one of these commandments, that all of the commandments aren't just telling you no, aren't just telling you don't do this, but at the same time they're also protecting something. So the last couple of weeks we've been talking about the sixth commandment, protecting marriage. It's going to be the exact same thing when the, then with the seventh commandment. God is protecting the things that he gives you. So let's just kind of look into the Bible a little bit to kind of just establish, does property even exist? You know, there are going to be a lot of things, a lot of people in the world that would say private property is not a real thing. <laughs> it's not something that people should have. But the seventh commandment in the existence of it kind of suggests to us that private property is something that does exist. It's something that you would consider for yourself. It's something that God gives you, but at the same time we can understand everything that God gives us is not only our own, but also something that's good for our good, for the love of our neighbor also, but then also ultimately a possession of God himself as the giver of all good things. So let's look up Acts chapter 5. We won't read this whole story, but I just kind of want to summarize it. It's going to be the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Does anybody remember what happens in this story with Ananias and Sapphira? Could you give me a summary? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. So at this point in the early church here, a lot of the disciples are handing over their property for the good of the church. So right before this story, at the end of Acts chapter 4, Barnabas gives over land and don donates it to the church, and everybody thinks that's wonderful. Everybody says, Barnabas is such a great guy. And Ananias and Sapphira see that, and they think, I kind of want a little bit of that praise, too. They want that same praise that Barnabas had for giving away his property, so they want to act like they're giving all of their property as well. But they withhold a little bit of it. They withhold a little bit of that property from the apostles, but want to still make it look like they had given it all. But listen here what Peter says to them in verse 4. He says to them, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed within your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So it's interesting what Peter says here. Because he makes it clear that their sin was not just that they didn't want to give everything to the church. He says, your property was your own. It was at your disposal. It was a gift from God. I think this is getting louder and louder. Anybody else sensing that? Is it okay? All right. All right. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Power is great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so their actual sin was that they lied to the apostles, that they wanted to have the appearance of having given all, but didn't actually want to give it all. But at the same time, we can see Peter pointing out that what is given to somebody from God is his own and is at his disposal even to do with as he wills. But at the same time, we're going to be talking about not only as he wills. Is this better? Is it okay? Still needs to go down. Not only as he wills, but also as God would will him to do. Um... So, I want to look into some of the things that Luther talks about in his large catechism that also go along with this commandment. Like we said before, it's not going to be just stealing, not just shoplifting or something like that. But Luther is also going to talk about dealing dishonestly in our business, in the way we would interact with one another. This would also uh, be under the category of stealing. Cheating people through something like bad merchandise, false measures. This is a very uh, important Old Testament concept, is false measures. We don't really know what this is talking about because we don't use the same system, but um, oftentimes what would happen is if somebody was paying money, and you know, I say I have a bag full of gold, and it's one pound of gold, the guy would literally put it on a, a measure, you know, where one side I put my gold in, another side he has his standard of what one pound is supposed to be to make sure I'm telling the truth. And it's to the point where in Proverbs over and over again it says God hates false measures. This seems like it should be something that, you know, God doesn't really care about. It seems like a really small issue. But in reality, God does care about our little affairs like this. That if we were going to cheat somebody like that, that is actually something God is very, uh, God's very in tune to. And then another thing we could put under this category is just any sort of financial trickery. This is one that I found interesting that we wouldn't normally think of when we think of stealing, but Luther also talks about being lazy in your own job and causing harm. If I'm going to be collecting a wage and then I just sit there all day, or I sit there until my boss is coming around the corner and then <laughs> pretend to work. Uh, I'm essentially stealing his money because I'm not doing the thing that he's actually paying me for. Uh, let's see. Working unfaithfully or overcharging for your work. So kind of the same thing we were talking about there. Dishonest ways of getting easy money. Um, can anybody think of anything else, or any real-world examples, maybe, in modern times that would, you know, fit under those categories, or anything that came to your mind that, yeah? Did you mention gambling? Gambling is an interesting one. Yeah, I didn't even think of that, but we could talk about that, yeah. What's the, what's the problem with gambling? Like, if somebody was saying, hey, we want to build a casino in town here, you know, it's going to increase revenue in our town. More people are going to come here. What's wrong with that? What do you think you'd say? Yeah. The wrong people are going there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's, it's not going to attract they, good they, business. They should, leave, they should drive by, go get a hamburger, and, and go uh, away. Yes. They, and if they tell me to get $2 in their pocket, they won't go spend it. Like, so I'm going to win. They never do. Uh, that's true. Anything else? Yeah, it's true. They're essentially stealing from their own families so they can invest it in literally nothing. It's just a black hole. Yeah. Because the house always wins. Uh-huh. So there are people who go there. There may be a few people who make so much money as long as you have a car for saying that. It's, um, you're kind of, you are kind of stealing from your family or loved ones. Right, so yeah. What about not reporting all of your income on your taxes? <laughs> right, yeah. They don't get out. They actually don't get out. They don't get out. But yeah, um, gambling is almost just in itself lying and deception, financial trickery, 
all these kind of things just packed into one, and then it's kind of just looked at as a game, you know? I don't know if you guys have seen this, but anytime I ever, you know, go on the internet or watch TV or something, it's just nothing but ads for gambling. It's not even something like, oh, I have to go to this sleazy casino on the other end of town. Now it's just everybody's constantly doing it on their phones, you know? Uh, and I don't think that it bodes well for the direction we're heading into, probably, if that's just so common. Um, anybody have any other thoughts on that before we move on? Yeah. A company that deals a lot with cash payment for product and they don't report that the revenue. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know someone. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, no income taxes or no, no taxes are paid on it and it bothers me a lot. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's extra money for them. Um, any other things people were thinking of, of modern, real-world examples that, you know, maybe people wouldn't normally think of as stealing, but you probably file under stealing, actually under Luther's definition here. Because I just have something, something else I was going to talk about, but uh, I want to give you a chance first here, yeah. The only other thing that comes to mind at one time, and I don't know if it is so much anymore, but it was so closely tied to the Mafia. Yeah. And kind of supported a very bad uh, way of life. Right, yeah. No, that's a good point. Yes? You could very easily do that to me. I would not know. <laughs> so please don't. All right. Um, so one of the things under this category that I was thinking of, uh, if you could look up Deuteronomy 23.19. Deuteronomy 23.19. Uh, could somebody please read this? You, not, you shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is lent for interest. Okay. Lending for interest. Does anybody know the old timey word for this? If you read it from the KJV, it would have said this. Usury. Yes. This is an interesting term, forbidden by God in the Old Testament to lend somebody something and then expect more in return than what you lent. This is also going to carry into the early church. This would be something that is just essentially unanimously condemned by the early church fathers. But it kind of fell out of favor to condemn this around the 20th century. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Anybody have any guesses? Somebody said it so, you know, just the general economy can make more money, and that's true. And the unfortunate reality is that the majority of our economy is pretty much just usury, <laughs> just on a large scale, over and over again. Uh, yeah? But then, but Having debt mm -hmm. has always been a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So it's okay now, but now to have something, you buy it before you can afford it. Yeah. And so what it used to be was you don't borrow money and you save until you can buy it. Right. Right. And that was that, you know that's that's really new. Uh huh. Yes. They were saying you can loan to foreigners. Yeah. Right. That's true. But not your brother. And I think I, mean, I think they're considering your brother. Yeah. And as Christians, this is in the Old Testament context where they're specifically saying to the people of Israel, do not practice usury. You can to uh, the nations outside. We as Christians are just going to say, or Christians historically have said, uh, we should have this principle for pretty much everyone. Uh, we're not going to have only within the church, but especially within the church, you wouldn't want to cheat your own brother or something like that. So this kind of puts us in a little bit of a pickle, I guess. We can talk about this. Where, uh, 
How do we participate in our modern financial system when so much of it is, uh, you know, just caught up in, you know, just greed and corruption on one hand, but then also kind of built on, like you were saying, debt, which is kind of just a overall bad concept in the Old Testament. And we can distinguish at first between true usury, which would be, I am going to lend you something, probably for a time you're in need, like uh, you had to have surgery or something like that. So I'm lending you the money at a time you're vulnerable, and then I want you to pay me more money than I lent you. That would be actually evil. And that's what uh, the Bible's getting at here. And I think everybody would agree today that that's wrong. We can maybe make a distinction between that and modern day investment. There is something different there where if I am actually giving something to a company in the sense that they know they are going to make more money with that startup, that that's not necessarily taking advantage of them. Because what's the core of this commandment not to lend at interest? Greed. What, uh, what else, what, what about thinking about the person that you would be lending to? Yeah, taking advantage of somebody and trying to keep somebody down, keep, you know, maybe like a certain class of people down through this cycle of debt and that kind of thing. Um, that's kind of the core of why God would command against this. So, yeah, I think we could say safely as Christians, we can in good conscience invest in something, because that's not trying to keep this person down, it's actually trying to give them a little bit of a boost or something like that. But, broadly speaking, what are some of the modern day equivalents where, uh, you know, like you're saying, people get into a cycle of debt, something like that, somebody might be taken advantage of by... Uh, I don't know, kind of like the promise of a loan that'll just get them like further and further into debt. Yeah. Yard sales. <laughs> what if you go to a yard sale and the owner that is selling an item doesn't realize it's priceless? Oh. They have it marked really low. Uh, Can you tell them? Wow. Or do you pay <laughs> for that real little bit of price? Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. That's a that's a tough question. What does everybody else think? If you are at a yard sale and somebody has a priceless piece of art and they don't know what it is and they have it for five dollars, <laughs> would you tell them or would you snatch it up and go sell it? I'd probably sell it and then split it with them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, where's the wrong? That's not true. Huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. And that, that's the important principle here. She was saying she would tell because the purpose of all of this, the seventh commandment, is to build up our neighbors. As Luther says in the explanation, even improve our neighbors' possessions and income. That if somebody is down on his luck, I'm not going to try to keep him down there. I'm actually going to try to help him out. Uh, which, I don't know, doesn't necessarily seem to always be the mentality that we have. It's always kind of just like, you know, how can I invest a certain amount of money here that would build myself up for the long haul? How often do we think about are uh, those sitting in this room, looking around at each other in our own church community, how we would build each other up? Or something like, uh, you know, in church is maybe one of the only places left where we have multiple generations interacting with one another at the same time, you know? Uh, if you saw a young couple that was just starting out or something like that, what are ways that we could think of, how do I build these people up? How would I help them out? Um, that's something to think about in the church. And I, I kind of just want to go back to this uh, concept of, you know, lifting people up, not just kind of perpetually pushing them down. Because uh, there are a lot of things that kind of hurt people that we wouldn't normally even think of being stealing or something like that. Uh, 
I even think about like, you know, if you had a rental property or something like that, it'd probably be a Christian practice to not just gouge people for as much as you possibly could. You know, if it's that young couple just starting out or something like that, that uh, just making them so they had to pay almost their entire paycheck just to live there, but rather could save and hopefully someday be in a house of their own. You know, I think that would be a Christian goal that Christians would want to help others in their own community achieve. Um, let's see. I think even something like, it's gonna, getting to a certain point with stuff like student loans, where I think almost that gets people into like a perpetual cycle of debt. Where, you know, you think you have to go to college, you think you're supposed to, and you don't really even know what you're wanting to do, so then you take a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars of student loans out, and uh, you would never be able to pay that back. Uh, that's that's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but that's the vision. That's also is actually it's a good example. It's a vicious cycle mm -hmm. because they have resources at their disposal. The cost of school goes up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because and so what happens is they're taking advantage. Mm -hmm. by raising the price because you can borrow the money to pay it. Mm -hmm. But if everybody was paying it out of their wallet, no one would be in school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're actually feeding that, like, that uh, uh, activity or that borrowing. Right, right. Yes? I know a company that will advertise we can get your CDL for you. Yeah. It's a license. And they don't investigate the person that they are promising to give a CDL. I actually know someone who went to the course, paid the money, and he had a jail time, and he can't get a CDL. Mm -hmm. So the company knew that ahead of time, so he still took his money and sent him to the course, and he still mm -hmm. he can't get a CDL. Yeah. Because he's got jail. But did he know that too when he started? He evidently did not know that, and they took advantage of the fact that he did not know that. So, can anybody else think of any examples like that? Credit cards? Yeah, something like credit cards. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, okay, in the end, uh, we always have to acknowledge that it's the person themselves that is ultimately responsible for these things. Even something like taking out student loans, even when you're young and you really don't know any better. Uh, we do have to acknowledge that. But we can also acknowledge that it is a responsibility for us as Christians to help people out. That if you saw a young person in your congregation going in a certain way that seemed like it might have uh, terrible long-term consequences, that, yeah, maybe saying something, maybe helping them out would be a good and godly thing to do. Um, but saying all of this, it might just kind of drive us crazy to just be listing off all of these things that are going on in our modern economy and saying how as I, as a Christian, even function in this. Because there's just so much going wrong. There's so much evil out there. Uh, not even wanting to get started on like, you know, do you support certain companies or not or something like that. Uh, you might just kind of be wanting to throw your hands up and saying, like, you know, what do I do? Do I just be Amish or something like that? Uh, <laughs> might, might be an option, might be an option. But at the same time, you can understand the general principles of what God is trying to get at for you in the seventh commandment. To not take your neighbor's money or possessions, to be faithful with your own money and possessions, and then also wanting to help those around you to actually thrive, not just keeping them at arm's length. Uh, and then with these general principles, we make those decisions in our own economy, you know? Because not everything's gonna be perfect today. It can't be, it's too complicated now, and it's too big for you personally to fix. Uh, there are things you can do, obviously, there are things, but 
uh, you know, unless you're the president or something, it's going to be pretty difficult. But you just need to ask yourself, how do I personally function? You're going to say something here. I think as a parent, you have to raise your children too to mm -hmm. understand money and how it works and how you help your mates or when they need help. Uh -huh. I mean, I learned not trying to try and be you know, the money well. Yes. Don't don't let your money rule you. You rule the money. Right. And that's a hard lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, and our money is a gift from God, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Everything yeah. comes back to. So yes. we, to honor him, we want to yep. use it well and respectfully as he asks us to do mm -hmm. to help our neighbors. Yes. yes. So we do a lot of initiatives with LWML, you know, for helping our neighbors mm -hmm. and doing different things. Um, but then you have to be careful also about that sin of pride mm. and letting not letting that get in your way, just like Ananias and Sapphira. They yeah. want it to look good in front of everybody. Uh -huh. And just remember that those things are important, but it's also important that we give the glory <coughs> to God for the benefits of what he has given mm. us and that we can share them with others. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think we do a lot. I know our women's group, we do a lot of support for our local and the Giving Tree now is for um, a local community thing, and mm -hmm. so it, it is important to keep that in mind, but I think we also have to remember that it's God's glory, so. Yeah, absolutely. You guys just helped us transition into the next thing that we need to talk about, which is just to say, like you said, where do all of our possessions come from? Like we said, God actually establishes that personal possessions exist, you can refer to something as your own property, Peter says, to do with according to your own discretion. But at the same time, where does every good gift come from? It's from God himself. He is the one who reaches out his hand and hands you all good things. And this ties into another theme that we've been talking about as we've talked through the Ten Commandments, is that each time we break any of the Ten Commandments, it's actually first a violation of the first commandment. Because as we were saying here, if I'm going to be so fixated on my own possession, or my neighbor's possession, that I want it so much that I would just take it, I'm actually fearing and loving and trusting in those things rather than the one who gives all those things. Uh, and that's, that's the other just constant theme that we have to be thinking about uh, as we try to deal with all of these things. Um, and then, when we have that mentality, knowing that all good things come from God, this motivates us then to care for our neighbors, like you're saying. Give money back to God, so what we call stewardship over our own money. Return, like we say in the offertory, returning our gifts of praise to the one who has given us all these things. We really don't give God anything that's not already his own. But at the same time, we see those needs that people have and can provide for them. Um, and like you are saying, there are some pitfalls with this that we need to navigate within them. We don't want to be like Ananias and Sapphira, prideful while we're giving. Because we know that it's actually for someone else's good, so that we can glorify God, not for our own glory. And it's also just something that God expects of us, needs us to do. It's not like we're doing a favor to God when we do this type of thing. Um, another thing that is kind of a pitfall, I guess, when it comes to giving, and this is kind of just opening up a, a larger issue that maybe we can discuss or debate, but... Um, People talk about when you give charity, what kind of charity actually helps and what kind of charity actually hurts people, almost kind of keeps them perpetually in the cycle of the situation that they're in rather than actually helping them out. Uh, has anybody ever, have you ever talked about this before, had thoughts about this before? Um, some churches will have policies behind this. If they have some kind of fund that they give to people, um, like on my Victor's congregation, they had what they called the love fund, where if somebody came in and said they needed to pay their electric bill or something like that, uh, the church would give out a certain amount of money at their discretion. Um, 
But something that people will talk about sometimes that you need to be careful about is um, if certain money for charity uh, that is given to a certain person is actually used for the thing that it's asked for, or if it's used for something that you would not want to support. Um, what kind of things, what kind of wise things could a charitable giver do to make sure that that didn't happen, or try to avoid that it would happen? Yeah. I used to work at a church, and when we would be asking things, we wouldn't give the money directly to that person. Uh -huh. We would say, what do you need to pay, and we would pay to the company. Uh -huh. So we knew that's where it went, and they did yeah. still not pay the bill. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good idea. making that distribution uh -huh. needs to be responsible too. Uh -huh. so for example, if somebody like you have, we'll pay your bill, let us bring it in and, and we'll kind of check directly to them on your behalf versus somebody that's got a gambling problem. Mm -hmm. I need to pay my electric bill. If you just give them the money, you're giving them drunk a drink, I think. You know, and we can't do that. Right. We need we need to be responsible givers too, so that we're just not blindly here you go and fueling a bad habit or, or something or a bad situation. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. But that applies to the organizations as well. Because you can look at them sometimes and look at their corporate offices, yeah. and you go, you know what? You know, so yeah. assessing the large funds and what they're actually doing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I think these are good guidelines, like if a church is going to do this, uh, sometimes people talk about, like you said, paying the bill directly. Sometimes people said if they see somebody on the side of the road and they're asking for gas, they will, you know, literally put the money or swipe their card in the, at the gas tank uh, instead of just handing them the cash. These are all, I guess I just want to say wise things that can be done. It's not, not, not a necessity, you know, am I saying it's, it's wrong or it's a sin to just hand somebody five bucks or whatever? Absolutely not. Uh, but at the same time, if you're trying to avoid certain things that may or may not happen, these are all wise things that could be, could be done. Um, let's see. Any, anything else on that particular note that uh, people thought of? Yeah. I used to help church in, in Paris distribute, but you would be shocked. Um, one woman dropped a piece of paper as she was asking for help. And I picked it up and opened it up, and she had listed every church and facility in the city who would help her, when they last helped her, when they could next help her, what they did when they helped her. And I thought to her, I asked her, I said, if you spend that much energy doing that, to keep track of that, you're a great organizer. You should be good at this, this job. <laughs> Why would I work when everybody else will take care of me and I can go get my fingernails done and, and buy uh, whatever I want personally mm -hmm. for me with my money and you all can pay for it. Mm -hmm. You can give them a counsel and to help. Because you made her like that so far. And then they make rules, you don't have to like that show for a long time a year. And then they figured out, well, let's see, let's put, the, put it in another name or something else. And then, but when they started coming in the name, uh, smelling so bad of alcohol, the pastor could smell it in his office with the door closed. We just said, let's stop. Yeah. 
Because even the gas cars, these are diesel. Well, gas cars are good things, but they kind of gas car the Kroger's and buy cigarettes. You know, so you can't really. So, yeah, the, these are all things that occur and we can be aware of them and be wise surrounding them. But uh, the other trap, I guess even when we bring up that part of the conversation that Christians could fall into then is to say, well, if they're just going to be doing this or they're just going to uh, use it in a way that I want to approve of, then I'm not going to anyway. And that's also not, uh, not an appropriate way to approach, approach the question as a Christian. That, think about God who gives everything to us so freely, even though he knows his people are going to abuse his gifts. He causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Our God who is so generous always, that Christians should then have that same mentality at the same time being wise, but at the same time not letting that wisdom ever deter any generosity that we might have. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. Good, good. Yes. Sorry. I have a question. Mm -hmm. When we give, for whatever reason or to whomever, and we feel good about it inside. Yes. Where do we draw the line between that feeling of good, like we've done something right, mm -hmm. and the feeling of pride? Yeah. Where is that line drawn? How do we know? <laughs> good question. Yeah. That's a very good question. Um. And isn't that kind of a little bit what we're talking about with Anne? Right. Right, yeah, yeah. Because it's not wrong to feel good when you do things that God ordains you to do. You know, uh, like God gives us food. If I ate a good meal and uh, felt good afterward because it was good food, that's a good thing, you know. That's not abusing the thing. That's actually just using the thing as God intended it to be. But there's going to be a certain line there where I would be falling into gluttony where I would be saying, I'm actually not thinking about my creator who has given all of these things, but I'm actually just focusing on this thing. I'm focusing on my own wants, my own desires. And I think that's the key of where that line is, really. You know, if I gave money to somebody and I was saying, I acknowledge that you are in need. I acknowledge that God has given me an abundance more than I need and I want to share it with somebody because you are a child of God. And I'm glorifying God through this. I don't see any problem with that. But once it's getting to the point where I'm essentially saying to this person, I am your savior, you know, I'm not pointing you to Jesus, I'm not glorifying Jesus, but I am standing in the place of Jesus here instead. Or I'm saying, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, throw, I'm throwing up all kinds of good works before God that now he needs to acknowledge how great a person I am or something like that. Uh, that is where I would draw the line. And, you know, it's not being super specific, so I apologize for, for not giving you like a hard line or something like that. But it's, it's right. It's a question we always need to be asking ourselves in every single one of these situations. Am I falling into this? Even when I think I have good intentions, am I falling into this? And if you examine yourself and you say, no, I don't think I am. I think I am just truly happy, glorifying God. Wonderful. But if you're wondering, you know, I, I maybe am being a little bit prideful here. That's just the opportunity to repent. That's the word of God working on your heart. That's a, that's a great question. Do you have anything else you wanted to add? No. Okay. Thank you for, that's a good explanation. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I, I had caught myself in a grocery store line one time where an elderly woman was struggling to pay her bill. Uh -huh. 
and I just felt compassion, and I said to the cashier, I would, I, please let me pay her bill for her. Mm -hmm. And this woman looked at me, she said, you don't even know me, why would you want to do this? And my answer was very simple, is the good Lord has blessed me, and that is what I wish to do. And so I, and it made me like, feel better that it didn't embarrass her mm -hmm. or me because I could tell that she was like putting things, okay, I can't take this. Yeah. And that they were yeah. essentials. And I just gave the glory to God that I was able to help her. Yeah. But, you know, it was unusual, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, well, now she's heard about our Lord. You know, mm -hmm. she, she went on her way, but, you know. Yeah. I gave him the glory that I was able to do that, and that this is what he would want me to do for her. Mm -hmm. okay. In the Catechism, there is a reference here to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which probably people are familiar with, um, verse 4 and 5, and the comment associated with that says, we should rejoice when we see him prosper. We can rejoice, but again, yeah. you give glory to where it belongs. Yes, yeah. That's a great point. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And I want to kind of take an opportunity here to just talk about how we think about our own good works in general. Because almsgiving, that is giving to the poor, is a good work. But oftentimes... Uh, the way we think about good works that kind of feeds into that pride that you were talking about is when we say, hmm, I'm going to go do some good works right now. <laughs> and then I have all my self-chosen, self-appointed good works <laughs> that kind of just make me feel better about myself, kind of just put on a show uh, that make me look like a good person. But oftentimes, I publish my list of all the people I've given things to. Right, right. <laughs> but oftentimes, the good works that God actually places in our lives are the ones that are just immediately tied to our vocations. That's why in Luther's small catechism, he lists out the table of duties that says, Consider your place in life your father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker. And then it's in those situations that God is actually going to give you good works to do. And oftentimes, it's going to be stuff that you don't want to do. <laughs> um, it's not going to be the kind of stuff where I'm saying, uh, you know, I, I'm doing some kind of super abundant work where only the only time I'm ever doing good works is when I'm volunteering at the soup kitchen or something like that. Although, that would be a wonderful thing to do. Oftentimes, it's going to be the thing that God has put immediately in your path that you have to do, you know, I'm talking about like doing the dishes, changing a diaper, or something like that, that kind of thing. But that is actually what God has placed before you as a good work. That is actually how you would be loving your neighbor. That's how you would actually be Christ for your neighbor. Not always these good works that we just get to choose that uh, puff us up a little bit, but actually the times where Jesus actually tells you to pick up your cross and follow him. Uh, times of actual self-sacrifice. And we can think about this as it ties to the seventh commandment, as we were talking about uh, giving alms too. But it's not always just going to be uh, out of my abundance I would give to somebody. But what if somebody next to you is struggling and you are also struggling? You know? What do you do then? And it's at those times when God maybe is actually challenging you to still, even in that situation where you maybe need a little bit of help to yourself, to also help that person. And that's just the church. That's what all of us are doing in the church constantly. Are you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say that to your point about when you give, we're, we're told to give, but to do so anonymously, not for self reward. Mm -hmm. So, I think a very easy delineation is when you give privately to someone in need and you tell no, then you're doing it the right way. It's when people say, well, look at me. I've, we've just given 
$100,000, well, that's great that you did that, but why do you need to, you're, you're looking, the, the people that do those things are looking for self-gratification of, look at me, I did a great job, because Christ told us, when we give, he didn't say to go out and advertise and say, hey, you, you, you gave everything you got to somebody in need, and I think one of the greatest gifts we can give to somebody is not a monetary or material thing, but it's us. It, it's the story of the guy, the, the offering plate came by, he had nothing, and so he got in the offering and they said, what are you doing? He said, I don't have anything, but I'll give myself. And you very, very rarely that you find something that's more generous than giving of yourself to someone. And to do it when, to your point, when, it, when it's needed. And then you know that's between you and God. Because then you have to kind of keep track of your good works. You're just doing them out of, out of the, your home. And that's a good point, too, that can kind of have a practical implication. Because... Our modern economy is extremely monetarily focused. Uh, but, you know, what if I didn't have enough money that I could help somebody, but I'm really good at a certain thing, you know? That could be another way that a person in the church could improve someone else's possessions and income, you know? Um, an old lady can't rake her leaves. Uh, you know, a teenage boy goes and rakes the leaves. Like, that kind of stuff would be wonderful, you know? Um, I think that's exactly what you're talking about, Jason. What an encouraging word, too. Mm -hmm. Can be one way of looking at a neighbor or a person or something. So, yes. You can uh, share things, but when somebody's going through the struggles like you are, you can share words of wisdom and encouragement go on. It's more than just money, but you like you said service, and sometimes you can do a trade. Uh, you can't wash a window, but you can sew something for somebody. A person can come in and wash your windows, and you can hem all their pants up, and you can hem them or something like that. I mean, it's yeah. trading of that. Uh -huh. exactly. Absolutely. Does anybody else have any themes from this study that uh, we kind of just glossed over that you wanted to return back to? Or just anything on this topic that you wanted to say? See. Pastor, did you want to add anything? Okay. Done a good job. <laughs> All right. Um, we, when do we go through? 1030? Yes. Or what is it usually? I think we have just uh, like eight minutes left or something like that. So I just wanted to say, uh, does anybody have questions from the service today? Feast of Transfiguration? Or just any comments that you want to say, things that stood out to you from the readings or from the sermon or any questions that arose in your mind that you want to bring up. Yeah. I just have a comment about one of the things that I enjoy the most about um, the study of the, the Ten Commandments is when I listen to comments and I listen to situations and, you know, what about this, what about that. I realize, and this is kind of, kind of funny, but kind of not really, it pretty much doesn't matter what I'm doing, I'm saying I mean, no matter what I do, when you go through and you really study the Ten Commandments, I mean, there's something sinful in there. I mean, if I'm giving something, I feel proud about it. I'm trying not to feel proud about it. I don't feel proud about it. You know, or, you know, I'm resentful that I'm giving, but I'm doing it anyway because that's what I'm supposed to do it for. You know, um, and so, it, you know, when I think about those things in that way, it's, Praise be to God that I have to say it because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what I do or how I try to do it. There's a pretty good chance I'm a sinner somewhere. <laughs> 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 so, I'm probably going to do that. That's, that's a good point, and that is uh, the true message of the scriptures that you're bringing out here that Luther brings out in the small called articles of the Book of Common That true repentance is not going to be just saying, oh, I realized I did this, that was kind of bad, if I stop doing that, I'll be okay. Going down a bullet point list that I would just confess to the priest, uh, you know, do a couple of Hail Marys after that and call it good. True repentance actually is to acknowledge that, like you said, everything I do is utter sin. That I have to completely return, turn from myself and turn to Christ there instead. That is justification.
that Jesus, though he was rich, became poor for our sake and gave our salvation not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, that that is why you are righteous. So, as we live in this life, you know that's what justifies you. You know that's what makes you righteous. It's not going to be these little things that you do here or there. It's not going to be how much money I give to X, how much money I give to Y, or how much money I don't give to these things that would condemn me. Those are the things that save you. That's the entire point of the Reformation. The thing that saves you is Christ. So then the question then is now that I'm here, what do I do? And that is what we're trying to talk about here when we talk about the Ten Commandments. We're not talking about what do I have to do as if it's, you know, some kind of obligation so that I can earn my way to heaven. It's saying since Christ has done all for me and put me in this new category as sort of God, what, how do things work in this household? How do things work in the household of God? And that's just the way we're trying to navigate them. And like you were saying, anything we run into is going to be tainted with sin. Anytime we try to work in our modern economy, there's going to be something wrong with what's going on. Anytime even I do a, when I do a good work for my best friend, uh, I'm going to be doing something tainted with sin. Maybe pride is somehow creeping in. Maybe I'm doing something out of my own selfish inclinations. So we try to navigate these things as best as we can, but in the end, like Luther says, we just repent of everything, laying everything at the feet of Jesus and knowing that he forgives all. You know, so it's not saying you can do whatever you want, obviously, no. But it's saying that we try to follow God's will, knowing that we full well can't in this life, but it's not futile, because the Lord does see these things and reward the good uh, that his people do, that he works in them through his Holy Spirit. Um, so it's not a hopeless life, it's the most hopeful life we could possibly have. <laughs> Anybody have any other thoughts? It's not our good that we do, though. We have to realize that mm -hmm. our salvation comes from Jesus alone. Absolutely. And sometimes when we get caught in doing good, oh, you know, and that's where part of our pride comes in. But if we have a prayer or a praise to God, mm -hmm. that we can actually cut up and that, yeah, I need something good, oh, this is going to save me. It's not. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, let's see how much time we have. One minute? Anybody have a one minute thought? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's close with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for being the giver of all good. And we pray that you would continually allow us to acknowledge you as the creator of all things and the one who gives us all these things and acknowledge you with true glory that is due to your name. We pray that you would also give us the opportunity to help those that are around us, those that are in need, so that we can improve their possessions and income, and also point them to you as the giver of all good things. We thank you for uh, coming to us today in your word and in your body and blood and the Lord's Supper. We thank you for your blessed transfiguration in which you showed your glory to the disciples, and we thank you for the glory that was shown to us on the cross where you took on our sins and the glory of your resurrection. And we wait until that day when you come again in glory to take us home to be with you. All this we ask in the name of your Son. Amen. Amen.